A CBC Color presentation. Toronto always performed well. It became very personal. They were the enemy. I hate to lose. You wanted to win. We were expected to win. The rivalry was just so intense. You can't get tickets for those games. What a great tradition it was. That's what the fans like. It was a big rivalry. I think I would have been a good Montreal Canadian. Every kid want to play for the Leafs, and here every kid wants to play for the Canadians. We want to beat him, we want to beat him back. The rivalry was still there. That's more than hockey team. We're such a part of the tradition and history of hockey in Canada. Nothing matches the atmosphere when the Canadians play the Maple Leafs. It's still there in the hearts of people. It was a great year to be a Canadian. The spring of 1967 brought with it a Stanley Cup final that few who were there will ever forget. Facing off are Canada's only two teams, the Toronto Maple Leafs and Montreal's Le Canadien. Theirs was both the bitterest and the best of rivalries. They know they wanted the cup badly. A country's undivided attention. And it was a year of Expo in Montreal. Everything was, was perfect. A clash of hockey cultures. We like to slow them down a little by the hitting part of it. In what will always be remembered as the final year of a 16 NHL. That's the beauty of sport. You never know what's, <laughs> what's going to happen. Hockey's most storied and decorated clubs together had carved a history of animosity on ice. But in the waning moments of the Stanley Cup of 1967, their rivalry was about to change forever. When the players shook hands that Tuesday night in May, none could have imagined what the future might bring. Maple Leafs' Cliff Fletcher and Montreal's Ronald Corey are today's builders. The men charged with recapturing the magic and with maintaining what is a living piece of Canadiana in a country of dwindling institutions. Montreal has almost always known success. Winning has become the tradition. And so last year marked a rare departure for the team when it fired one of its icons, Serge Savard. 
with Serge, it was very difficult because, as I said, he did very well. <clears throat> but I thought, you know, I, I thought after the, uh, <clears throat> the season, the previous season, and last year, the, be the, the beginning of the season, I can see you know, that something was missing with the team. Savard was the loyal soldier. I did accept the decision because I, I was not the guy to call the shot. And I said it at my press conference, the only way not to be fired is to own the team, is to be like Errol Ballard to make all the decisions. It was very difficult, no question about that. Difficult for him, difficult for me. But now, you know, the, I have a new group in place, and now we have to uh, rebuild and uh, win again. Today's team knows that success will be measured against the Canadiens' incredible record of 24 Stanley Cups. People who were be here before us, they, uh, they succeed uh, on the ice and off the ice. We feel the pressure that we have to succeed too. In rebuilding, the team looks to its recent past for Mario Tremblay to stand this time behind the fabled bench. There is some irony that on this tumultuous day in Montreal's history, the rival is Toronto. The game will be their last in the Montreal Forum. It used to be that 14 times a year, the rivalry was renewed between Canada's two great teams waged in its two great arenas. Sadly, no more. 60 years of rivalry. A remarkable 35 Stanley Cups between them reduced to two games a year. Now comes the closing of the forum. But while the game may have changed, the past is not forgotten. The new Molson Centre, built in the heart of Montreal, opens with the memories of the past and dreams of future glory. To commemorate the accomplishments of these two men, the Maple Leafs have produced banners recognizing the honor. In Toronto, the Maple Leafs look to their past. I'm proud to be back in the Leaf organization. Uh, I think that uh, I can contribute uh, uh, to help uh, rebuilding the uh, the image and the tradition that it has had. With its history rooted before the Great Depression, the Leafs are three decades removed from a championship. Their new president learned as a young boy the team's tradition and its role in hockey's greatest rivalry. I know as a youngster in my house in suburban Montreal, my father was a fanatical Montreal Canadian fan, so uh, when I'd sneak upstairs to the bedroom and turn on the Maple Leaf game with Foster Hewitt, I'd have to keep it down low because I wasn't allowed to listen to the Maple Leafs. The Toronto story begins with Foster Hewitt's game calls at the old Mutual Street Arena. His play-by-play -play of the Toronto St. Pats inspired the legendary Con Smythe to buy the team and rename them the Maple Leafs. This was 1927. Smythe's vision was to build a Stanley Cup champion modeled on his own determined image. Smythe was, um, was a very dominant person. Um, he, could, uh, he could singe a, a person with a glance. He had a manner uh, that attracted attention. Smythe was tough. So were his military-style training camps. He was flamboyant using money won on a horse race to buy Ottawa's King Clancy. But would King play for Toronto? I'll play any place, he says. I'll play any place, as long as I get what I want. Well, I said, uh, I don't want to offer you anything, but you're for sale, and I'm going to buy it. What do you want? He says, anything you give me, I'll play for King Clancy's fire ignited the Maple Leafs. Other players were lured in an unlikely fashion. Connie Smythe came to me and he said, uh, uh, Red, he says, you've had enough of this amateur hockey. He said, uh, we'd like you to come with us. And I said, when do you want me? Well, he says, tonight. <laughs> with new players, Smythe and his assistant, Frank Selke, needed a new arena to play in. 
Maple Leaf Gardens was built in five months at the height of the Great Depression. First opened in November of 1931, the Gardens was hockey's showcase venue. It stands today as the game's last great arena. Many never set foot in the building, but knew it intimately through the words of Foster Hewitt. Getting ready to start the second period, and there's no score. Toronto Maple Leafs, nothing. When traveling in the summer to Western Canada, the players soon discovered Foster's celebrity. Who do you think the, the first person that they wanted to see was? Foster Hewitt. <laughs> he was the most popular <laughs> uh, man on the trip. Hewitt's support was cultivated by the Leaf owner. Smythe knew he was getting close. Well, they're doing the best they can, Foster, and whether they win or lose, they'll play like champions. Then the last piece. Coach Dick Irvin brought leadership in Smythe's style. Of last year or this year's edition. Well, I think this year's team is about the gamest bunch of athletes I ever had any connection with. All right, Jack, come on. As the opening season came to a close, the Leafs found themselves facing the Rangers in the 32 Cup Final. It was hard not to believe in Khan Smythe. His disciplines made the Leafs successful. The team won its first Cup in the Garden's very first year. Smythe, Selkie and Irvin, the Leafs architects, would soon be at the heart of hockey's most bitter rivalry. And then Aurel Joliet, uh, he, he, he only weighed about 135 pounds all the, all the time he was in the league. But he was one of the best wingers in, wing players in the league. And he, uh, he, he didn't have much hair, Joliet, and consequently he wore a baseball cap. And uh, the thing we tried to avoid was knocking off his baseball cap because he, he became ferocious <laughs> when his baseball cap was knocked off. And, and it was seen to rouse the rest of the team even. So we said, now be careful about Harrell's baseball cap. Don't knock it off. <laughs> that was sort of a joke. The roots of Canadian hockey trace back to the late 19th century. Amateur play became widespread. The game's popularity moved through Montreal, Ottawa, and Kingston before eventually finding its way up the St. Lawrence to Toronto. The Montreal Canadiens were formed in 1909, a local team for players of French descent. It wasn't long before the Forum was built nor was it long before the first heroes emerged. There was George Vezina. And then came the legendary Howie Morenz. He had so much speed uh, and he was so light in the skates, his blades would only hit the ice about every third stride, you know. He was just, just so fast, such a great adept stick handler. The Canadian swift skating style became fire wagon hockey. The team, known as the Flying Frenchman. Personally, I enjoyed playing against the Canadians. Uh, they were smooth, and, and uh, they were quick, and, and they were dedicated. Uh, it just seemed to me that, uh, that, the, that the Canadian players were very proud to wear their uniforms. Toronto watched the Canadians win three cups with more ends. But in 1937, tragedy struck. Shortly after breaking his leg in the game, Morenz died in hospital. He rested at center ice in the Forum. Red Horner was a pallbearer that day. He was so loved by the fans that they, they just could hardly hold their excitement and their, their, their uh, feelings about him at that, at that funeral. It was, uh, it was simply something that you never, re never forget. His death marked a difficult time for hockey in Montreal. Though the Canadians drew in Toronto, the Forum was almost empty. The Canadians were in deep trouble. Hockey in Montreal, very strange to say, they almost folded. Uh, 
the Maroons had folded a couple of years before that. Hockey interest was nil. The last regular season game that year, of a year when the Canadians won only 10 games, their worst season in history, Toronto played here in Montreal, and the crowd was about 1,500. Emile Bouchard was one of the young players recruited to revitalize the team. They were last in the league, and uh, they had all hockey players that uh, were uh, over the hill. The talented Toe Blake had come over when the Maroons folded. There was hope he would spark change. But the real bid to save the Canadiens came in 1940, when Montreal lured coach Dick Irvin away from the Maple Leafs. Going home in the car, my dad turned to me and says, do you think you could cheer for the Montreal Canadiens? Well, I mean, I had grown up Toronto Maple Leafs. You know, I was eight years old. How could I ever cheer for anybody but the Toronto Maple Leafs? Of course, he knew. Dick Irvin brought his reputation for hard work to Montreal. The practices were long and tough. Ken Reardon joined the team that year. They had just slipped so far, and uh, when Dick Irvin Sr. came in here, they didn't know what hit them. <laughs> he brought in just like an English sergeant major in the Army. And they very quickly, more, you know, within a period of four years from that time, uh, became the best team in the National League. Montreal-Toronto games took on new intensity. Brawls were common, some even involving Smythe, who saw the Canadiens as the enemy. Now 10 years without a cup, Smythe's team was building around Sil Apps, a gifted athlete. The pass goes astray, now Campman and Apps. Apps' Apps winger, Bob Davidson, noticed a change when playing in Montreal. Fans were different down there than they are in Toronto, so it was more or less, it was a, a rivalry, and everybody wanted tickets to go and see us play, so it, was, it went over big. So big that by the spring of 42, the Leafs had surpassed Montreal and advanced to the cup final. Major Con Smythe was given special leave to address his players before the final period of the cup's seventh game. His talk inspired the team, but the celebration would be short. Smythe soon headed to Europe to lead men on the battlefield. He was very inspirational. He was a great disciplinarian. And he, and he had a good judge of men, he really did. And he was very, very tough, but he was very honorable. Many of his players, including Captain Sil Apps, followed Smythe to war. The depleted Leafs were hardly a match for Montreal anymore. Toronto the Good hated uh, the fact that the Canadians had uh, retained uh, these outstanding hockey players and that the, the Maple Leafs had gallantly gone off to war, leaving these uh, fuzz-faced boys to, to hold up the, the home forces. And uh, so when the Canadians came into Maple Leaf Gardens, uh, the fans wanted to see the bully crushed. So for the first time in the growing rivalry between Montreal and Toronto, race and language became an issue. I mean, the club, there wasn't too many guys. That was during the war. There, were, there was not too many players. Most of the players were going to the army, and I was lucky enough that I had all those injuries, and I was called for the army, and uh, uh, they gave me a discharge because I was in a cast. Montreal grew even stronger with Elmer Lack uniting with Richard and Toe Blake to form the famous punch line. Dick Irvin went to Rocket Afters. He said, I don't know what you're so pleased about. He said, we won a game 9 nothing one night. And he said, I got all nine goals. So he said, Rocket, I don't know what you're, they're making such a fuss about you. And he was joking, you know, but he, he they respected him. He, he had done everything everybody else had done and probably done it better. Bob Davidson remembers being assigned to shadow the Rocket. He had those piercing eyes. <laughs> and uh, I didn't check him all the time, but I checked him most of the time. And uh, he, uh, he could uh, grab that loose puck and get let go and go and score a goal, no problem. Montreal fans didn't appreciate Davidson's style. I had my stick up over the boards, and a guy grabbed my stick and yanked it right out of my hand. Well, here I am 
And I'm looking at the referee and I think he's going to blow the whistle. He didn't blow the whistle at all. And the Rocket went in and scored. I think he scored five goals after that. <laughs> the seeds of rivalry were being sown. With each club getting stronger, Toronto fans would push their Leafs to beat Montreal. When we used to play a good game in Toronto, the fans used to cheer us and uh, they used to boo Toronto because they were playing bad. So it was the same thing here in Montreal. We tried not to play bad hockey, we tried to win all the time. A fact well known to the playoff bound Leafs. The Canadians had a great team. I think they lost five games all year. Something like that, you know, maybe tied about six or seven. But they only lost five games. So they just annihilated us in the playoffs. They've knocked us out four straight. The champions didn't lose a single playoff game in the spring of 44. The following autumn, the humiliated Leafs wanted revenge. During the regular season, there was great, great, uh, uh, well, I wouldn't say animosity, but there was great rivalry between Montreal and Toronto. The tie when Montreal played Toronto was no way. They had a saying, a tie is like kissing your sister. And that's the, what it was when you played Toronto. The Leafs made it to the playoffs only to face Montreal and the Rocket, who that year had scored 50 goals in 50 games. During that year, Dick Irwin had proclaimed that that Montreal Canadian team was the greatest team that had ever played in the National Hockey League up till that time. And we knocked them off in six games. Depleted by the war, clearly the underdog, the Leaf victory in 1945 remains one of their great triumphs. It was phenomenal that we won. I, we, Bob Davidson and I get together at times and we still chuckle how we ever uh, beat the Canadians <laughs> with the great team they had. The surprising Leafs went on to defeat the Detroit Red Wings in seven games to win the Stanley Cup. Canadian history was in the making. That, I think, was really the start of the rivalry. I think it was the mid-40s, because in 1945, the Canadians had their big year. And through the late 40s and early 50s, the rivalry was very intense. The Leafs and Canadians were now hockey's best teams. For six straight years, one of the two would win the Stanley Cup. And certainly uh, impressed when I went into the Maple Leaf dressing room for the first practice. And uh, I recall very well, because living in a small town, uh, you, uh, I, I wore up, I had a, uh, which I thought was a lovely parka, and I walked in the Maple Leaf Gardens, it was a snowy day too in early March, and one of the Leaf players, and they're all in, in uh, over suits, suits and overcoats, even though it was a practice, and one of them said to me, he says, um, is that the kind of uh, clothes they wear down in Fort Culver? And I said, oh yeah, sure, you know, not thinking. But on the way back to where I was living in the, on the uh, streetcar, I thought, he was just being very subtle, but he was letting me know that Maple Leaf hockey players don't come to practice or anywhere else in just parkas. Frank Selke was fed up with Con Smythe. When they rebuilt the Canadians, though, they brought Dick Irvin, and then they brought in Frank Selke Sr. They both were here in Toronto, and they both left and went down to Montreal. This team became the Toronto Maple Leafs. Every bit the enemy, Selke was intent on beating the Leafs. Smythe was equal to the task. In 1946, the rivalry was on. He just... Uh, just didn't want to lose to the Montreal Canadiens, and so he let us he let us know at, at all times. Selkie and Smythe, they, they did not like each other, and we didn't like the players either. They wanted to build a club that uh, would beat the Toronto Maple Leafs, and uh, I think the rivalry started actually back when Frank Selkie went down there. Selkie and Irvin were reunited. They instilled regimen where there had been none. They built a farm system, and from it, Came one of the greatest teams ever. Out of there came Bellevue, Jeffrey, 
Dickie Moore, Saint Laurent, Goyette, Marshall, Plum, all came from Mr. Selkie's foresight. Selkie knew he was lucky to have the rocket. Smythe tried several times to buy him, but Selkie knew the fans would tear down the forum brick by brick. Richard loved scoring against the Leafs. Clancy told us the rocket walked up, up to him and he says, hey, King, he says, uh, don't give that kid hell for that bad pass. He says, I do that all the time. <laughs> The Montreal-Toronto rivalry reached new extremes. When we played Toronto, here we were. We, the, we are the French, they were the English. Richard versus Ezenicki. We supposedly are Catholics, which I happen to be one playing the Protestants. Reardon versus Apps. And also it was Quebec versus Ontario. Bouchard versus Kennedy. It was a legitimate rivalry, a real hate. The Canadians were declared the enemy. The Leafs attacked with military precision. In 1947, Toronto defeated Montreal in six games to win their fourth Stanley Cup. Smythe's Leafs won a game in 1948. Tom Smythe's tirades and maneuvers kept interest high in Toronto. He threatened to drop netminder Turk Broda unless he lost weight, and earlier had traded five players for Chicago's Max Bentley. Smythe's iron-fisted approach continued to produce results. As Mr. Smythe said, uh, when you're on that ice, you don't say hello to the guy in front of you. If he caught you talking to him <laughs> on the ice, <laughs> when the game was over, he'd come in and tell you, hey, that cost you 50 bucks. Toronto Montreal hockey became rough and mean. And from it came one of the longest and most bitter disputes. Cal Gardner and Ken Reardon felt its lingering effects. I, somebody cross-checked me across the mouth. I had cut him on the lip. We were fighting for a playoff spot. There was a, quite a bit of blood on the ice, and uh, my chewing gum, we all chewed gum and fall on the ice, and I could see a couple of teeth sticking in it. And all of a sudden, one night, he gives me the elbow and breaks my jaw. Uh, I wanted to get even. I, it's, uh, I make no bones about it. He had already told uh, a magazine that he was going to break my job. And the week the magazine came out, I ran into Cal Gardner accidentally. I never got a penalty, and unfortunately, he broke his jaw off both sides. It was an awful crack. To, that's an awful thing to do to a man. So I had to go out in front of Mr. Campbell, and I got a real strict talking to, and uh, he didn't find me $1,000. He made me post a bond of $1,000. Today, nearly 50 years later, I wouldn't talk to him. I wouldn't lower myself to talk to him. If I'd played one more year, I would have had one more go, I think, because $1,000 is not that much money. This was the rivalry that marked the post-war era. In 1951, the Leafs and Canadiens met again in the finals. All five games went into sudden death overtime. The Maple Leafs winning their fourth cup in five years on Bill Barilko's memorable goal. Barilko was mobbed by his teammates after the goal. Sadly, it would be his last. That summer, Barilko disappeared in a plane crash. The tragedy weighed heavily on the Maple Leafs. The advent of television in the early 50s brought Hockey Night in Canada into every Canadian home. Foster Hewitt's images created on radio came to life. Coinciding with the arrival of television were a new generation of stars. It was a, a good learning for a young fellow to come up and, and have the opportunity to, to learn from the, the, the real veterans of hockey. 
you know, Big Butch would take you aside if you did something wrong. I know he helped me tremendously. Take me aside and say, Dickie, you don't say that or you don't do this. Jean Beliveau was barely a teenager when word of his prowess spread. The young Beliveau played several years with Punch Imlac's Quebec Aces before Frank Selke was able to sign him. Imlac called him the best player he ever coached. Beliveau was acutely aware of the demands awaiting him. I think fans of Montreal were expecting so much. And I had the feeling that whatever I was doing, uh, it was never enough. Then there was Bernie Jeffreyon, who later matched Richard's 50 goals. And Jacques Plante, who won five straight Vezina trophies. Montreal grew so strong, they reached the cup final an amazing 10 years in succession. In 1953, the Canadians defeated Boston to win their first of six cups in the 50s. It seemed Montreal's success would run uninterrupted. Until that infamous night in March 1955. He lift his stick up in my face, and he cut me over below the nose and then on the side, and I start to run after him. Richard swung his stick wildly at Boston's Hal Laco. I had a linesman that was from Boston holding me from behind. The rocket hit the linesman in his bid to get free. Uh, Laco was swinging at me, so uh, the third time when I turned around, he was beside the board, and I just pushed him there and turned around and hit him. When it was done, so was Richard. Richard will be suspended from all games, league and playoff, for the balance of the current season. The suspension was harsh, even by today's standards. Fans were outraged. Both Richard and NHL President Clarence Campbell attended Montreal's first game after the verdict. Barely a period of hockey was played that night. The forum evacuated. What ensued on the streets of Montreal has long been the debate of sociologists and historians. Suffice to say, for the Canadians, hope for the season was ended. For Maurice Richard, the moment is never forgotten, nor forgiven. Ed. Campbell in my in my mind and I I I didn't like him very much so I, I never I spoke to him a few times after that but uh, that was all, was all I said you were wrong I think you were not alone to to sus suspend it. Toronto had its own troubles. The fifties marked a steady decline for the Leafs. Not even the fire of King Clancy's coaching could rouse the team in the wake of the Barilco tragedy. The Leafs developed some good young players, but failed to make it beyond the playoffs' first round. By contrast, Montreal was rich in talent. With Toe Blake now behind the bench, Another leader was about to emerge. I told Blake when he asked a few of us, he said, am I, am I seeing right? Is the kid that good? Henri Richard was a teenager just working out with the club. I went up to Mr. Selke and uh, Morris came with me because I, I, I couldn't speak a word of English. So he said, he's gonna come up. He came up with me. And yeah, Mr. Selke asked uh, uh, my brother Morris if you think Henry is ready to play with my, the, old, the big team. Morris said, sure, he's ready, and he walked out, and he made me sign a contract. I didn't know what I signed, and I didn't know, even know the, the amount of money that I was getting, and I just signed and left. <laughs> the Richards, along with Beliveau, Moore, and Jeffreyon, would unite under Toe Blake to form hockey's greatest dynasty. Blake knew full well the abilities of his players, but ensured each understood the team came first. A great hockey player is just like a great artist, and a great artist has its tendency to be an individual. And 
But if you put those great artists together, uh, I think that's what makes a championship. Toe Blake was the man who would mold this greatness. When he joined us, he said, listen, I, what can I tell you guys? He saw the greatness of the team that he was going to take over. When we won our first Stanley Cup with him in 55, you know, there was no end. He said, I told you so. You know? Uh, Connie Smith, when he used to come to Montreal, he used to sit beside my wife in, uh, on top of the exit and where, and behind the Toronto Maple Leaf bench. And she, he used to talk to my wife. He, he told her many times that he would like to get the, to get me to play for the Maple Leaf, but uh, the trade never came. So I, uh, it was in the paper a few times, and there was a picture. The, the, the Trump, uh, Toronto photograph uh, had a picture in the paper. Uh, with a maple leaf sweater on, but he took only my face. I never wore the one <laughs> maple leaf sweater. Selkie's Quebec system yielded a continuous supply of talent. We had so much power. We had that big man on the blue line, Doug Harvey. Bert Olmstead and Jeffrey Owen. Rocket Rocket and Dickie Moore. Butch Bouchard. John Bonneville, my brother, and is out blown. We dominated the league at the time, so Toronto, we, we kind of had them under, our, uh, under control. The Canadians moved to the top of the standings in the 50s, while the Leafs struggled just to make the playoffs. The Habs Cup win of 57 was the second of five in succession. Montreal was delirious with excitement when their team captured its third in a row, equaling the Leafs' cup run of the 40s. Canadians' fans grew more demanding. We expected every year to go out and win the league and win the Stanley Cup. If things were going bad, you didn't want to walk down St. Catherine Street because the people would be bugging you a little. You'd be walking down the back alleys or you'd stay home. A new era was beginning in Toronto. In the fall of 58, after missing the playoffs two years straight, the Leafs hired little-known George Imlach as assistant GM. The new man went about proving himself. Not too many people really knew that much about punch. At least, certainly, I, I didn't know that much, and I think most of the guys that uh, were playing on the team at that time really didn't know what punch was all about. Punch Imlach was a driven man. With less than half a season in the organization, he had become GM and coach. Imlach was outspoken and profane. He pushed his players hard. The youngest responded, and the team found new heights. That was the year when we made the playoffs on the final game of the year. We were the Cinderella team of hockey, and we made it right through to the finals against the awesome Montreal Canadiens. We went out in four straight, but nevertheless, we were the team that wasn't supposed to be there, but we we're certainly a team of destiny. When the Leafs met the Canadians in the spring of 59, the rivalry was reawakened. They hated each other, you know, and I used to sit in the dressing room and listen to the other players say, look, at, they really have to be up against Montreal because they had a powerhouse. Montreal won their fourth cup in succession. Imlach ensured each player knew his objective. And as I went out the door, he said, we have to face Canadians if we're going to win the Stanley Cup. He says, we're going to have to beat him. And he said, we need somebody to check Tullivo. And he said, that's what, I think you're the final piece in a championship team. He said, I think. And that's your, going to be your role. When the teams met again in the 60 Cup final, the Leafs had a strong young lineup imbued with Imlac's mission to beat Montreal. Bob Davidson did a great job at developing young players. And uh, along with some older players, Alan Stanley, Tim Horton, and Johnny Bauer, uh, it kind of uh, knitted into a real solid team. Still, Toronto was no match for the Canadians in a series that would be the Rockets' last. A pass intercepted by Maurice Richard. Maurice Richard passed it right for the net. Moore took a whack at it. Maurice Richard right in front of the score. Maurice Richard's final career goal capped the Canadians' fifth straight triumph. Richard always appreciated the Toronto fans' support.
up outside of Montreal. And the best place to win it is driving here in Toronto. Because Imlac knew Montreal was his only obstacle. This is the team I've got to beat, and I, that's, uh, that's the objective of all your work, is to win the Stanley Cup, and if it has to be the Canadians, well, then it has to be the Canadians. During the 1961 season, Imlac was certain his was the best team in hockey. Everything the Leafs undertook was done with one intention in mind, to beat the mighty Canadians. The question was whether Imlac was the man to lead them there. Punch was uh, a great, I think, one of the best general managers. I wouldn't call him a coach. Uh, I think it was the power of uh, the people that he had within the organization when he came. But people in the organization were changing. Con Smythe turned the reins of the Leafs over to his son Stafford and a committee known as the Silver Seven. Stafford Smythe was a good hockey man. His instincts suggested punch Imlac for the Maple Leafs. Imlac proved him right by adding quality players to the team Smythe had sculpted. Stafford Smythe was impressed by Punch's determination, but knew Imlac could be abrasive. That's the way he was, and he felt, that's all teach you. If you want to play hockey for me, you got to be a, an Imlac player, and that's the way a lot of us were. And there's a lot of players who didn't like Punch. They, had, they were, had a lot of disagreements with him. Bauer was one of those players intimidated by Imlac. And John, you know, Punch, uh, just lorded that over him all the time. His pension plan and, and staying with the Leafs. And all Johnny wanted was 10 years in the pension plan. And, uh, and, and, and Punch thought that was funny, and it wasn't funny. Chicago surprised both Toronto and Montreal in 61. But the following spring, the Maple Leafs returned to the cup final and beat the Hawks in six games. It was Imlac's first Stanley Cup. Toronto and Montreal had been expected to meet in the final, but Chicago upset the Canadians. While Imlac and the Leafs were visibly united in celebration, there was a growing tension between the coach and his players. As soon as I started having success, and they tried to put a ceiling on what a player should make, we had a lot of problems. Imlac's dressing room was not always a happy place. It didn't help when an astronomical million dollar offer for the Big M was rumored. I received a phone call from my dad waking me up in the morning saying that I was sold to Chicago for a million, and uh, I had to check with the paper if it was 100,000 or a million. I wasn't too sure in the uh, zeros. Uh, I never made anywhere near the money that I was worth. Punch Imlac and Toe Blake first met as opposing coaches in the old Quebec Senior League. They brought the rivalry from the ice to behind the benches. Both were very uh, good coaches because they knew uh, the, uh, the capacity of each of their men. Although publicly cordial, animosity developed. That's when he has all his skills. I hate agreeing with you, Punch, but this one time, I think you're right. Imlac's distaste for the Canadians became so intense that he was disappointed to be facing Montreal in the first round of the 63 playoffs. He wanted to beat them in the final. Over the line with Vicky Moore, takes his shot, Bauer kicks that out. It's knocked out the, the Leafs line. won in five games, the series underscoring the intense competition between Blake and Imlac. Punch had great respect for Toe, but at the time, the feeling was not mutual. Toe didn't have the same admiration for him. <laughs> so when I came back, I used to say, Toe, he really thinks a lot of you. <laughs> Toe didn't care one bit. Toronto won their second straight cup, beating Detroit in five quick games. Imlac's popularity with the media and fans soared. Well, I don't know how I got the, the tag as a miracle man. I just do my job and a, I just have to be a little lucky, that's all. Under Imlac, ticker tape parade seemed the norm. Leaf fans were getting accustomed to success again. In the 64 playoffs, the intensity of the rivalry grew. 
didn't matter whether you were sick or you were tired. You went out and you played the game of your life, and there never has been and never will be an experience greater than a Toronto Maple Leaf in a Montreal Canadiens hockey game. The shadow cast by the late 50s hardened the resolve of the Canadians. Both were down heavily. Play got rough. Ferguson now being bumped by Brewer. The teams were going end to end in reckless abandon. Almost up into the Hodge. Hodge took a sweep at Bathgate with his stick. The semi final went to a seventh game. Dave Keon scored all three goals in a 3 1 Leafs win. As well as I, that there's a great rivalry. There's a lead pass to Keon. Keon is going in a goal. He's kicking scores. We like to play well against the Canadians because they're a great hockey team. And, and we have to play our very best to, to beat them. The two teams were in the midst of sharing an amazing 13 cups in 14 years. Toronto was greeted by Gordy Howe and the Red Wings. Facing elimination, Leaf hopes were sparked by a twist of fate. Bob Bond's overtime goal was scored on a broken leg. Bond left the game on a stretcher but with his leg frozen, returned. His dramatics led to a third cup. There was joy that night, but smiles masked an undercurrent of unhappiness. It was an ongoing battle with Punch Imlac. I didn't agree with his methods, I didn't agree with his approach to hockey, and I didn't agree, agree with his unnecessary disciplines, because if he required disciplines of us, he should have demanded the same things of himself. As the victorious Leafs closed the season, there was a foreboding sense about what lay ahead. It's one of my greatest joy, and at the same time, one of my greatest surprise that morning, when uh, Toe came back after the secret vote, and he shook hand with me, and he said, boys, here's your new captain. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I knew uh, Boom uh, was very upset. Uh, uh, you had uh, Dickie Moore, Tom Johnson, and Jeffrey Young as the three alternate. And I've uh, been uh, roommate with Boom for 11 years. Uh, and uh, and uh, I remember going to see Mr. Selke after a few days. I said, Mr. Selke, I said, me, you know, that's the team. I never expected uh, to be named captain. If, they, if this is going to upset, me, it's the good of the team. Give it to anybody. He said, I said, I cannot go to the room and uh, tell the boys that their, their choice is wrong. So that's their decision. If some players are upset, uh, they'll get uh, over with. And it took a, a day or two and uh, uh, kept on roommate with Boom, and <laughs> we've been friends uh, all along. Yeah. 